In yesterday's lecture, uh, I gave some kind of uh, general overview of uh, some of the topics we're going to consider and uh, uh, explain some uh, kind of basic results about the behavior of integral points on curves under etal morphisms, which uh, were used, uh, or a variant of which, actually, a sort of refinement of which was used by uh, Hugo Chapdelaine in his afternoon lecture to discuss some qualitative uh, features of the behavior of the generalized Fermat equation, which we saw, even though it's not a curve, behaves very much like, if, for example, it obeys the same kind of fundamental trichotomy as, uh, as uh, I described in the morning lecture on algebraic curves. So today I want to kind of get down to business, so to speak, and prove uh, the theorem of faultings, which I mentioned in my first lecture. Uh, about uh, rash integral or rational point, the same thing on smooth projective curves of genus at least two. So the theorem is, the, so let x be a curve over a number field, so k here is gonna be a finite extension of the rationals, so be a smooth projective curve over k or, uh, of genus of genus at least two, so I'm going to call G the genus. Uh, then the conclusion is that X of K is finite. So I'm here, I'm talking here about uh, uh, K rational points because I've only given myself a curve over, over K. I haven't specified an integral model for this uh, curve, but it's going to be useful for uh, very shortly, so I'm going to actually fix from now on a finite set S of places uh, of K such that X has a smooth model over the spectrum of the ring of S integers of K. Uh, so customary sometimes to call this, to denote this by another letter like script X or something, but for, I'll just call it uh, capital X by abusive notation. So I'm going to give, kind of give myself a model for this curve uh, over the, uh, an affine open of the spectrum of the ring of integers of K, uh, where this uh, curve has good reduction. So I suppose that basically the curve, I've written down an equation with coefficients in this ring of S integers, where the curve doesn't have any singularities in any of the reductions, modulo any of the primes, that are not in S, okay? And that's uh, I'll be uh, using later. And, okay, so the proof of this theorem of faultings proceeds by a series of reductions, where every time one transforms the problem into something else. And each step of the, of, the, of the proof is actually very interesting because it gives a perspective on other uh, fundamental questions that arise in the subject. So uh, that's really the sort of the overall structure that I want to stress rather than the technical, uh, some of the technical means which I won't have so much time to cover. So I want to really uh, describe a series of reductions. There are actually going to be five reductions in all which uh, every time um, kind of lead to a transformation of the question. So the first uh, step, the first reduction, um, is to uh, a question known as the Shafarevich problem. And this is a question that we already had a, a flavor of, at least, in my first lecture when I spoke about zero-dimensional schemes and stated the theorem of Hermit. So in the last lecture, so the Shafarevich problem,
So, okay. So remember in the last lecture, in my first lecture yesterday, that I um, defined this set, Sha of OD, which was a set of isomorphism classes of finite flat etal algebras over spec D. And you can think of, of over, over spec O. And you can think of this geometrically as being the, zero, the set of zero dimensional schemes, which in the generic fiber consists of D points, and which have good reduction over spec O. Because uh, on the level of uh, the coordinate ring, having no null potents corresponds to none of the points sort of coming together. So that really in, in all the special fibers over spec O, they still consist of D disjoint points. So this is sort of zero dimensional schemes of good reduction uh, and, and cardinality D up to isomorphism over spec O. Now you could of course uh, ask for, I mean ask the same kind of question for higher dimensional varieties or uh, other kind of geometric objects. And that leads to a uh, much more difficult question. So we saw that this is finite. That's a theorem of Hermite. And you might ask whether there are similar finiteness results for isomorphism classes of higher dimensional varieties with good reduction outside a prescribed finite set of places. OK, so um, that leads to um, the, uh, OK, so I'm, I'm going to make the following definition. I'll, I'll be interested in this problem for the following classes of geometric objects. Uh, the first, which is the key one for this section, is what I'm going to denote by Sha of OMG, which are going to be the isomorphism classes of smooth curves of genus G over the spectrum of O. So isomorphism classes of smooth curves of genus G over spec O. So I'm, when I say smooth here, I really I want to emphasize that I don't just mean that they're, they're non-singular in the generic fiber, but also that if I reduce the equation, that these are come with models over, over O, and if I reduce these equations modulo any prime ideal of O, I still get a smooth curve over the residue field, over the finite field. OK, so that's the first uh, kind of object that I'm interested in. Well, we're going to be uh, a key role in Faulting's proof is played by abelian varieties, which are kind of higher dimensional generalizations of elliptic curves, which you've probably encountered already in the, in, in the lectures so far in last, last week and so on. So I'm going to denote by Sha of O A G the corresponding collection of isomorphism classes of, but now, abelian varieties of dimension G. And then, uh, so this is isomorphism classes. And one can also do something slightly different, namely consider, instead of taking, when one has abelian varieties, well, the morphisms between abelian varieties, uh, there tend to be uh, a lot more in some sense. And uh, in particular, uh, there are what are called isogenies, which are uh, morphisms that are finite to one on abelian varieties. And we can, instead of looking at abelian varieties up to isomorphism, which is a sort of finer uh, classification, one can, try, one can look at them up to isogeny. So we'll look at isogeny classes of abelian varieties of dimension G, of, of course, always with, which are smooth over, over O. So I'm going to, this is going to be the set of isogeny classes. And these three sets are going to play a crucial role in uh, my description, at least, of uh, the proof of faulting theorem. So isogeny classes of abelian varieties of dimension G over the spectrum of this, ba uh, over, over this fixed base that I've given myself. OK, so um, the basic result, uh, the basic conjecture that was made by Shafarevich is that all these sets are finite. Sha of O dash is finite. But this is kind of a far-reaching generalization of uh, the theorem of Hermite, which I discussed last time, sort of to higher dimensional varieties, either curves or uh, abelian varieties. OK. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that's a good uh, thing to stress, yes. K isogeny classes. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, but um, if I take a K I's, if I take a, uh, an abelian variety which is K I's, if I start with this, an abelian variety of respect O, and I look at a, uh, one which is K isogenous to it, it will still have a model over spec O. I guess that's not completely obvious. I mean, uh, but it's, it's a fact. So, yeah. Yeah, you don't require extra, extra bad reduction when you do that. But it's important that the isogeny classes are over K. I mean, so I don't want to. Uh, yes? No, I, I, I'm, I'm taking uh, just smooth uh, models, yeah. That's all I need for now. Yes. Okay, so, um, so now the, so the, the, the basic result that governs this first reduction is a theorem of Kodaira and Parshin, which says that uh, Morial's conjecture follows from the Shafarevich conjecture for curves. So the Shafarevich conjecture for curves implies faulting signal. Oh, I should maybe say that uh, I sometimes use Mordell conjecture for uh, what I called here faulting's theorem. That's maybe a somewhat old-fashioned uh, terminology. Uh, Okay, so before it was a proof by a theorem of faultings, it used to be called the Model conjecture. For those of you who are too young to remember that. So, uh, okay, uh, so let me give you a sketch of the proof. So the idea of this, this is a kind of very, very, uh, a very surprising result because we're transforming a question about rational points on a single curve, on a single fixed, uh, uh, projective curve over a number of fields into a question about the collection of curves of some given genus over a fixed base, a spectrum of a, of a ring of S integers of a number of fields. So, so the idea of the proof, I mean the, the, the key ingredient is the, what's called the Kodaira Parshian construction, which to every point in X of K associates an element of Sha O um, M G for some G actually, which has nothing to do with this G. So, I mean, uh, so the Kodaira partial construction is a is a construction which to every point P in X of K um, constructs a a curve which is in fact a, a finite covering of the curve X um, satisfying the following properties. So the, the key properties are the, are the following. Uh, first, that this, point, this curve XP, or the map pi uh, from, is, is ramified only at the point P. So there's a single, so you've kind of constructed a, a, a covering of X, which is not quite unramified, but it has only one uh, ramification point on X, which is this point P that you gave yourself. The second uh, feature of the construction is that the genus of XP uh, is greater than one. Uh, and depends only on, um, on x, so to speak, yeah, only on x, only on the curve x that I started with. I'm going to call g prime this genus. So it doesn't depend on p, that's the, the main point. So it's g prime, it has nothing to do with the g, I mean, it's, it's related in some way, but I mean, it, it is not equal to the genus of the curve x that I started with. And the third uh, property, which is crucial, is that XP is smooth over the spectrum of, so not, so you still have to, I mean, you'll see why when I describe a bit this construction, it's not quite spec O, but it certainly has a smooth model over spec of O where I've inverted to. 
So there's going to be the prime two is going to somehow appear in the construction, meaning that possibly this curve could have a bad reduction at two. But in any case, this this curve has good reduction outside a prescribed finite set of places. So uh, so this is a, an assignment from um, from x of k to this sha of o uh, of one half. Uh, mg, mg prime, right? So, while, so this construction gives you a map from x of k to sha of O uh, m, oh sorry, O of a half mg prime. And then if we can show that this map has finite fibers, which I'll explain shortly, and then the finiteness of this set will imply the finiteness of that one. Okay. So uh, let me just g give you a, a, a quick description. I mean, there's actually several variants. The key, the key fact to know is that this construction is possible. There are several variants that appear in the literature uh, for the construction of this uh, XP. I'm going to give you one which is uh, rather simple. So, um, so here's an outline of the construction. So I'll give it first over, well, I'll, I'll give it only, in fact, over spec K. So I'll, I'll do it over the generic fiber and then kind of uh, wave my hands a little bit to convince you that it, the construction would extend, would make sense over spec O, or spec O of a half, actually. So we start by considering this curve X. So my goal is to construct a specific covering of X, which depends on P and has this very special ramification behavior that it's only ramified at P. So I start by embedding the curve X in this Jacobian which is an abelian variety of dimension g. And um, one way, actually the universal way, of constructing abelian unramified coverings of the curve x is to consider unramified coverings of the Jacobian, of which there are many. I can take, for example, any multiplication by n map. That gives me an unramified covering of the Jacobian. And I, here I'm going to take the minimal n. I just take the multiplication by 2 map, which is an unramified covering of degree 2 to the 2g. Okay. And uh, I consider uh, uh, the curve, which I'll call x tilde, which is the pullback of uh, this uh, of this unramified covering over x, the restriction to, to x. So okay, so now I've constructed. So this x tilde over x is an unramified covering of degree 2 to the 2g. But it's not what I want because I want something which, which knows about p. Okay? So I do a further uh, thing. So I'm, I, I am going to let, um, so I, I don't know, what, what do I want to call this map? Yeah, okay, here I, sh I I don't want to call this pi, I'll call it pi sub p to emphasize the fact that it depends on p. Okay. So here, uh, I'm going to call this unramified map pi. And let me, let me denote by pi inverse uh, of p I'll write uh, pi inverse of p as p tilde plus d, where d is an effective divisor of degree 2 to the 2g minus 1. OK, so I single out a p tilde. Uh, this p tilde uh, is going to belong to x of k. So for, the, for this, I have to say something. I mean, you see this embedding of x in Jacobi is by no means unique. Uh, it depends on a choice of base point, and the, the base point I choose, of course, is the point P. So, so this uh, embedding is the one which sends the point Q to the equivalence class of the degree zero divisor Q minus P. This is the degree zero divisor up to, up to principal divisors. Okay? So this is the map that I've, this, this is how I've chosen to embed X in its Jacobian, and then if I look at uh, the inverse image of P, well, there's going to be one point in this Jacobian, which is rational over K, to make the identity element. OK? And I take the point P tilde, which corresponds to the identity element. So that one is, 
sort of a, a nice uh, a God-given lift to the set of k rational points, and then I look at this the remaining uh, inverse image is some divisor which is which is uh, k rational, although it's a sort of a sum of uh, of this many points. The individual points that appear in the divisor are not necessarily defined over k, but the, the collection of these points is k rational. Okay, so in x tilde, what did I? What did I say? Yes, x absolutely x tilde. Okay. Yes. So why would you do this? No, no. So what? I mean, okay. So you say that. Um, I don't understand the question. I mean, you're. Yes. So I have a point P and X of K, I can extend it to a section over yes. spec O, okay? Then, then we remove all the points of the section, one point from the point. Yes. And also the singular points of that point. Yes. Uh -huh. Then we have a section over the surface of the negative of the Yes. And we can find the finite covering finite covering of these girls. Yes. Well, not projective because it's not complete. if you've removed some points. Yes, but, uh, oh, on the special fibers only, you're removing points. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, we can, uh, the special covering of these would be the upper half length. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we can find, we can find some, some, some finite covering which would be the special covering. And then it would be the projective. Uh, so you're, you're describing me maybe some other variant of the Kodai part? It, it's, it's possible. It's possible that something like that would work. But maybe let's talk about it after, the, the, uh, after my lecture. So, but let, so definitely we, we can discuss that. Yeah. I mean, there are, as I said, several variants of this construction which uh, appear. And one actually also works with, with fibrations. That, maybe what the, the, that has the flavor of what you're alluding to. So, okay, so uh, here I, I um, so I'm going to let the JD tilde. So I want a kind of variety which plays the role of the Jacobian, but allows me to construct uh, coverings which are ramified at certain points, certain divisors. So I'm going to look for the analog of the Jacobian whose uh, etal covers or isogenies classify uh, coverings ramified at D, at D, at this divisor. And that has a name, it's called the generalized Jacobian of, um, of x tilde d. And uh, I'll just uh, give you a uh, kind of um, description of this uh, variety in terms of what it uh, describes. Uh, uh, so in terms of its L rational points for some finite extension of k. A tilde of L corresponds to the set of L rational divisors of degree zero on X tilde. So that's sort of like uh, the description one has for the usual uh, Jacobian. One considers these modulo principal divisors not arbitrary principal divisors, but divisors of the form D of F with the property that um, f of uh, d prime is equal to 1 for all d prime of degree 0 supported on the uh, divisor d. OK? So that's sort of the, the, the description of this set of L rational points. So it's actually an extension of the usual Jacobian, the Jacobian of x tilde. is uh, a quotient of this general 
as Jacobian JD tilde. And the kernel is 2 to the 2g minus 2 copies of the multiplicative group. So there's an exact sequence like that, which uh, is an exact sequence of algebraic groups over spec k, over k. So, um, Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, supported outside B. I mean, you have a, if you have an L-rational divisor, you can always modify it by one of these so that it has support outside B. Yeah. Okay, so uh, and that's not hard to actually to see this kind of exact sequence given the description I gave here. Um, okay, and uh, there's a theory of kind of a, sort of analogous, a geometric uh, analog of class field theory which tells you that all abelian covers of uh, this curve X tilde, which are unramified outside D, are basically classified by isogenies of its, or yeah, I mean, uh, group homomorphisms of the generalized Jacobian. So we also can embed X tilde into this JD tilde by sending uh, a, po uh, a point on X tilde to the equivalence class of the divisor uh, uh, Q minus P tilde, okay? And then I look at the multiplication by two map on JD tilde and take the pullback. And that's the thing, that's, that's the curve I'm going to call XP. So that's the kind of diagram I have. I hope it's not confusing. This is my diagram. Okay. And sort of by, by construction, this curve XP is a ramified only at, uh, uh, over X tilde, it's ramified only at the points in D, and since all the points in D map to P, this is, uh, you get this behavior of the, of the, uh. so, okay. So we've constructed a map, which I call R1, from X of K to Sha of O of one half mg prime. Okay, so maybe let me just give you an exercise uh, in understanding this construction together with the riemann hurwitz formula, which is to compute g prime. So you'll see that g prime, there's an explicit formula for it, uh, basically depends only on g. Okay? Uh, so uh, it's independent, of course, of p, as you would expect from the way I described this construction. Uh, okay, so we have this map R1, and then the key point, of course, is that R1 has finite fibers. Yeah, I mean, when I say this, I'm, I'm sort of implying that this construction, which I described over the generic fiber, extends to spec O of, one, of a half. The reason for the half is you see the, the prime two is somehow very much involved in the construction. I'm taking the coverings of degree two, and it wouldn't be reasonable to expect that these still uh, maintain good reduction over, over the primes above two. Those become generally bad. <clears throat> Okay, so why is this the case that R1 has finite fibers? That's the theorem of the Francis. Um, okay, so, uh, so otherwise, you see, if, if R1 has, uh, if there were infinitely many P that match to the same curve, that would mean that there would be a curve with infinitely many dis distinct morphisms. So if, um, so the point is that the set of morphisms from Y to X is finite. That's the theorem of the Francis. And if uh, there was an infinite fiber, then there would be infinitely many XPs that would be isomorphic to Y. And, so that you would ha and since these are ramified at these different points, P, uh, you would have infinitely many dis distinct morphisms from Y to this curve X. So this is true, of course, only if the genus of X is greater or equal to 2. Uh, what is y? Uh, y is any curve. So Y is any curve. Why any curve? Actually, I mean, this is over C. I mean, I, I don't, uh, here, I, it's not an arithmetic theorem. It's really a, geom a geometric theorem, a geometric result. If I have two curves over the complex numbers, then the set of morphisms from one to the other is finite. Okay, so, um, uh, so this is actually interesting because this is, I mean, 
this is kind of a uh, simple geometric ingredient in the proof, it's the main point where we use the fact that the genus of x is greater or equal to 2. Of course, this is false for genus 1 because it could always translate any morphism by uh, translation by a point on x. I mean, so that's where, uh, well, that's really actually mainly where the, of, uh, the model can do the faulting theorem breaks down for cursive genus 1. Okay, uh, so, okay, so that's the, uh, the, the first reduction. So now our goal has changed. Instead of trying to prove the finiteness of x of k, we're going to try to prove the finiteness of this collection of curves of a fixed genus with good reduction outside this fixed finite set of primes. And um, now we be, we're, we're going to, in fact, reduce the problem still further or, or modify it still further by working with abelian varieties instead of curves. This turns out to be also very important. Yes. No, 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 but I'm, I'm using it uh, f uh, in a proof by contradiction. I'm supposing that this does not have finite fibers. So that means that there is one curve, which I'm calling Y, which is isomorphic to XP for infinitely many Ps. And that would mean that this Y has infinitely many maps to X, one for each P, right? And these maps are all different because they have different ramification locus, therefore, Okay, so um, so now I want to describe the second reduction, uh, which is actually less surprising than the first, which is to pass from curves to abelian varieties. Okay, so, um, so now I consider a second map, which I'm going to call R2, uh, which is the natural map from Sha of O M G to Sha of O uh, um, A G, which is given by taking a curve X or an isomorphism class of curves over spec O of genus G and assigning to it, maybe I should call this G prime, I guess assigning to it the Jacobian. Okay. And again, uh, this map, R2, has finite fibers. That's a co consequence of a theorem of Torelli. Torelli theorem that R2 has finite fibers. Um, well, you basically the idea is that you can recover a curve from its Jacobian pretty much. Not quite. You need a little extra piece of data, which is the principal polarization arising from uh, the realization of this abelian variety as a Jacobian of, of a curve. But then a given abelian variety can only carry finitely many uh, principal polarizations. And that's the, the content. So um, up to finite ambiguity given by this, uh, um, so the point is that y is so x, maybe, let me call this y, because I don't want to confuse with the curve x that I had before, that I started with. So uh, y uh, is determined by its Jacobian together with the data of the principal polarization. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry. It's sort of a technical point. It's enough to know for what I'm saying that really you don't lose too much information in passing from the curve to its Jacobian. Okay, I'm not, I don't know. This is one uh, th technicality which I won't have time to discuss in these lectures. So is the, uh, the, 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 well, the rather important role played by the polarizations in these arguments. So, okay, so that's actually all I wanted to say about the second reduction. It's not uh, too surprising. In the third stage, 
we're going to pass from uh, isomorphism classes of abelian varieties to their isogeny classes. Uh, that's a fairly natural operation to perform also, but that turns out really to be the heart of the argument of faultings. And that's where, actually, in fact, all that I've mentioned until now are reductions that are not at all due to faultings. I think they, well, they were known before, but here the, is, a, is a crucial new ingredient. So the third reduction is to pass to isogeny classes from abelian varieties isomorphism classes to isogeny classes. So here we consider the map R3, which I'll call R3, from the set of isomorphism classes of abelian varieties of dimension G prime over spec O to the set, yeah, okay, so I guess here I've replaced O by um, I replaced over half by O. So I've inverted in this O, I've, I've inverted two. Okay, I mean I don't want to keep carrying this one half along with me. So I consider this map from Sha O A G prime to Sha of O I G prime, the set of isogeny classes of K isogeny classes of abelian varieties with good reduction over uh, spec O, and then uh, the theorem, which is considerably deeper and is due to faultings, is that this map has finite fibers. Um, so let uh, A be an abelian variety over uh, K, then there are finitely many isomorphism classes of abelian varieties. Uh, over K that are K isogenous uh, to this abelian variety A. So the K isogeny class of A is finite. And so, another, so that's just another way of saying that this R3 has finite fibers so that I can reduce the problem of showing finiteness of this to showing finiteness of that one. Okay, this is a, actually the technical core this result is the technical heart of faulting's proof. And the main ingredient in this, the key technical ingredient is the, is the notion of height, of faulting's height. So the key ingredient in the proof is the notion of the faulting's height of an abelian variety. So faulting's defines this height using Arakel of intersection theory and studies its behavior under isogeny. So that's sort of the, the sort of a simple way of summing up the proof, although the proof is quite, it's considerably uh, well, <laughs> delicate and difficult. So um, I, I'll, just, I don't know, I'll just, of course, this will, in some sense, if you want, you can take this as a black box. I'll say a few words about sort of the overall aspect of the proof, uh, but this will remain largely a black box. This is a, a piece which I'm not going to go into much detail over, okay, this sort of basic finiteness result for isogeny classes. Um, let me just say that there are two theorems that Faulting's proofs, theorem A and theorem B. That, so the first is that the number, actually, maybe, I mean, in fact, maybe I'm, I'm running a little bit short of time, so I'll maybe skip that part. Yes, but here I don't, in fact, I don't care. With this statement, uh, I mean, I said before that uh, if I have a abelian variety which has a smooth model over spec O, any variety which is k isogenous to it will also have a smooth model. If 
but I don't have to, so I don't have to mention that. So, I, so it, it's really a result if you, you don't need the models. I mean, for stating the results, it's really a result about a billion varieties over K. Okay, um, okay, now I don't have time, so I'm, I won't say anything about this. I'll just sort of, so it's, let's take this as a black box because I want to get to the next stage of the proof. Uh, but okay, the basic idea is that we have this, we define this height on a billion varieties and then show that the height doesn't change. So the height, has, like all heights, like all reasonable heights, has the property that uh, the set of a billion varieties of bounded height is, is finite. And then one studies how this height behaves under isogeny. And uh, if one can show that it doesn't change too much, that the set of heights, set of values taken on by the height, for example, is finite, then one wins. And that's basically the strategy that, that Faltings follows. Uh, okay. So this will kind of be a black box in the argument, is, but this basic finance result will be used later. So now we have to show that the set of isogeny classes of a billion varieties with good reduction outside of this uh, uh, finite set of places is finite. And now we come to a the fourth reduction, which in some sense, to my mind, is one of the most interesting uh, passages in the proof. And that is to the passage from isogeny classes, from the problem of studying isogeny classes of a billion varieties over K to that of studying elatic representations of the Galois group of K. So this is one of the most basic fundamental constructions in arithmetic. We start with an abelian variety. So given A an abelian variety, over k, we can consider its module of L to the n division points, which as a, so as a, as a finite group, this is a finite group, as a group, it's isomorphic to 2G copies of Z mod L to the n Z. But of course, these points uh, are endowed with the natural action of the Galois group of K. I mean, they're, they're not defined over K. They might be defined over some finite extension. But the Galois group of K permutes these points in a natural way, but it preserves the addition law on the abelian variety, which is an algebraic group law. So it acts linearly on this uh, rank 2G module over ZL to the N. So this comes equipped with an action of GK, which is what I'll use to denote the Galois group of K bar over K. And um, OK, so, so one prefers to work with modules that are non-torsion. So a very useful construction in this subject is to pass to the inverse limit of these L to the n division points as n gets larger and larger. So one defines the Tate module, TL of A, to be the inverse limit under the multiplication by L maps of these modules of L to the n division points. And as an abstract group, a profinite group, this is isomorphic to 2G copies of ZL, of the elatic integers. Again, it's equipped with a natural action of the Galois group of K. And um, if one wants now, one can even work with vector spaces. One can invert the prime L and define a 2G dimensional QL vector space by simply tensoring this Tate module with QL over ZL. And then one gets this nice uh, 2G dimensional representation of the Galois group of K with a lattice coefficients. And this object is sort of key to understanding a lot of properties about the abelian variety. Okay, so I want to sort of describe some of the many structures that this uh, elatic representation possesses because now we're going to sort of transfer the problem of studying these isogeny classes to that of studying isomorphism classes of these elatic representations. So what are the, the key um, features of
Okay, so, um, so we have the first observation is that, so VL of A, as I said before, is a uh, 2G dimensional QL vector space equipped with two uh, commuting actions. So um, we can consider the algebra, which I'll denote E. This will be the QL algebra generated by the K endomorphisms and K of A um, acting on VL of A. So of course there's a geometric action. Any endomorphism of the abelian variety defined over K gives rise to a linear transformation on the Tate module uh, tensor with QL. Okay? And so I take this uh, endomorphism ring and I tensor it with QL. So I just I look at all QL linear combinations of endomorphisms. So that's E. And the second algebra, or yeah, the second algebra is what I'm going to call pi, the capital pi. And this capital pi is the Galois action. It's the QL algebra generated by the Galois group of K acting linearly, as I said before, on this uh, representation. Now, these two actions commute because, of course, any uh, endomorphism defined over K commutes at the action of the Galois cable. So we have this nice uh, structure. And OK, the other thing I should mention, which I should, maybe should have mentioned before, is that VL of A depends, um, or, well, the, uh, you know, up to I mean, the isomorphism class, class of the, G, the GK module, or this GK representation VL of A, depends only on the isogeny class of the abelian variety A. So it doesn't matter if you take two isogenous abelian varieties, you will get the same representation. That's not hard to see because the isogeny induces a map from the Tate modules with a finite um, co-kernel. And once you tensor with QL, you get an isomorphism. So you don't see, uh, you don't distinguish between isogenous abelian varieties when you pass to the uh, elliptic representation. So that's why it was somehow useful to uh, be able to, uh, that, that, that in making this passage from abelian varieties to isogeny classes, we didn't lose more than a finite amount of information so that uh, we're still kind of, uh, we're still in control somehow. So now, so what we have here is a map, which I'm, which I'm going to call R4, which maps the set of abelian varieties with good reduction outside some, some set S uh, to, um, so via this uh, VL construction, this operation of taking the Tate module and tensing with QL, it maps it to isomorphism classes of um, two G dimensional, a 2G prime dimensional, dimensional, uh, elliptic representations of the Galois group of K. Okay. So now there are two things I want to do. The first is to show that this map has finite fibers. And then, so in other words, that passing from the isogeny class of the abelian variety to this elliptic representation, you actually, in fact, don't lose any information at all. Not only has it finite fibers, it's actually injective. And then the other thing, I would like to show that this set is finite. Now, this is not <coughs> absolutely. In fact, I need to assume more. So I haven't put enough adjectives oh. here. Okay, I'm going to have to add a few adjectives to have any hope of showing that this set is finite. Okay, uh, so I want to first begin by saying. Uh, a few words about sort of the basic properties of this elliptic representation, which will allow me to kind of pin down further the image to a set which eventually I'll, whose finalness I'll eventually prove that I'll be in the, in the second lecture tomorrow, in the part two. Okay, so that's the 
my, so those are my two goals, which we'll see are actually related. I mean, we're, we're going to kind of uh, tackle both of them at the same time. Well, what can I say about this allotic representation associated to my abelian variety? I can say a great deal, actually. There's a great deal of, of uh, structure that's known. Um, OK, so uh, basic facts. about V L of A. So the first fact is that uh, V L of A is semi-simple, it's a semi-simple representation over E as a representation of the algebra E. In other words, it breaks up as a direct sum of irreducible representations. And so E is a semi-simple QL algebra in particular. So this is a sort of a basic fact about the category of abelian varieties that if you have a, a sub-abelian variety, then in the category of abelian varieties up to isogeny, it has a, it has a complement. Okay? So, uh, um, so uh, yeah. So the category <coughs> of abelian varieties uh, sort of up to isogeny, so where, where you invert isogenies formally if you want, uh, is a semi-simple category, is semi-simple in the sense that all exact sequences are split, right? So uh, that uh, sort of allows you to show that, that this any, any uh, well, the abelian variety itself uh, w would break up into irreducible pieces as a module over the endomorphism ring, and then the same is true for the associated uh, elatic representation. So we sort of know something about semi-simplicity as a module over E. Uh, the second... Uh, thing that we know about VL of A, this is something that, that, that Ambrose was alluding to, is, and that's here where we're using the fact that we're, we're starting from Sha of O. So VL of A is unramified outside uh, uh, out, outside S where, okay, what is S here? I didn't use S before, so I guess I can use it now. I mean, so S where S is the set of all primes which are invertible in O, okay? So the primes where potentially the abelian variety could be acquiring bad reduction. So if the abelian variety is, is singular at some place or it doesn't have, doesn't have a, a smooth model at, a, at some prime, then uh, the Galois representation will typically be ramified. In fact, will be ramified. So those are sort of bad primes. And we also have to include the set of primes that divide the prime L, uh, the, you know, the prime where we were, because we're taking these L to the end division points and that those modules typically are ramified at L. This is sort of the same phenomenon as I had before when I described the Kodaira partial construction. When I was taking these uh, multiplication by two maps, I was getting coverings which had bad reduction at two typically and that's the same kind of thing going on here. Okay? For, for when I take L torsion points, I can't expect to have an ramified. But, but outside this finite set S, which is fixed once and for all, which is finite and doesn't depend on A, I have good reduction. The third uh, uh, basic uh, property of this uh, representation is that it's what it's, it is what is called a rational representation. So VL of A is a rational representation. Uh, meaning the following. So given a, a prime V of K, which is not in this set of bad places S, given V not in S, I can consider, so VL of A now is unramified, so I can consider the Frobenius element at the prime V, which is a well-defined conjugacy class in the Galois group of K. So it acts, I mean, it's, it's well-defined up to conjugation, so I get a well-defined conjugacy class of elements acting on this elatic representation VL of A. And I could certainly look at its characteristic polynomial is well-defined. It doesn't depend on, on the choice of prime above V or whatever. And so this characteristic polynomial has, so has a characteristic polynomial with coefficients 
in z of t. So uh, in z of t. So it's a polynomial in t with integer coefficients. And moreover, we can say something about the size of the roots with roots, which I'm going to call um, alpha 1 up to alpha 2g prime, satisfying that the absolute value of these alpha i's, alpha, uh, alpha j's, uh, in absolute value is less than the square root of the norm of v, so the cardinality of the residue field of the prime v of k. In particular, I see that the trace of this Frobenius element in absolute value is bounded by 2g prime times the square root of the norm of v. So I have a bound uh, on the trace of uh, this Frobenius element, which depends only on the prime v, on this norm. And I know it's an integer. Okay. In fact, one can say even more about that. I mean, here I made a choice of a prime l, and this characteristic polynomial of Frobenius is independent of l, provided that, of course, that l is not and equal to v. OK, this, OK. Yeah, I'll raise it. Actually, I'll raise it here now because fin I'm finished with it. So now I've added a few adjectives to my image. Yes. Well, no, no. These two things are. I, I need less. I mean, these two things are results of they. Okay. Uh, this is a sort of this a, the simpler case of Deleen's uh, Riemann hypothesis for varieties over finite fields. This is a case of curves. Well, these are, of course, serious results. I mean, it's not. Uh... Now, OK, so w thanks to these uh, three facts, I can add, I can sort of pin down the image a little bit, right? Okay, I, so I can add here unramified outside S, outside S. So this set of primes which are invertible in here together with the primes above L. And uh, I, I can also add the adjective rational. Um, yeah, rational representations and ramified outside S. Okay, I'm still missing one adjective to make the image. I mean, so this is still not a finite set. I'm still missing one uh, adjective. I, mean, I don't know if someone can say what I'm missing here. So, so, I, so this set here is still not finite. I mean, it has no reason to be finite. Okay. And uh, let me just. What is it? Yeah, yeah. No, that's in, that's in, in the when I said rational, I mean this particular. Thing right with the, with the together with the balance on the roots. There's something I'm missing. Yeah. What is? A a what representation? The missing point is that you have a spirit representation. Uh, that's that's true that I could add this extra piece of information, but I would still not be enough actually to. So it's true that I had this extra structure, this kind of pairing on the Tate module. I'm actually not going to talk about it. I'm not going to need it. It would, it would sort of, you're right, it would kind of make this a bit smaller, but it would still want to make it finite. The key point is, is what Ambrose mentioned, which is semi-simplicity. I still need to know these representations are semi-simple. And so these points here I've glossed over because they sort of are much predating Faulting's proof. But one of the key things that Faulting's proved in the course of showing the Morel conjecture and improving the Morel conjecture is showing that these aliotic representations are actually semi-simple as modules over pi, over the algebra generated by the Galois group. So we, we had this um, semi-simplicity over E, which followed from the general theory of abelian varieties. But we have much deeper this uh, fact of semi-simplicity over pi. So I'm just going to state that, and I'll probably end there because I'm running a bit short on time. Um, so, uh, so this is property four.
So for um, um, uh, VL of A is semi-simple as uh, over pi, as a, as a representation for this algebra pi. And this is actually somehow deeper, okay? And I mean, it was proved certainly more recently. This was part of Paul Faulting's proof. So, um, so okay. So, 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 what, what, what do I need to do tomorrow to comp to finish the proof, or I mean, to finish my outline sketch, the module of things I left out? Uh, describing the strategy for proving uh, the Morel conjecture, well, there are three things. First, I'm going to explain to you how faulting shows that uh, the semi-simplicity of VL of A. The, the second thing I'm going to show is that this uh, assignment, which I called R4, has finite fibers. And it turns out that the, uh, accomplishing these two things somehow, these two goals are accomplished somehow hand in hand. I mean, some of the same ideas come up in the proof of, one sort of proves both things simultaneously, so to speak. So that's why the, the first thing I'll do tomorrow. And then finally, okay, now, thanks to this, we, we've uh, added another adjective to our image. So we have that these are semi-simple, pi semi-simple. They break up as a direct sum of irreducible elatic representations of the Galois group of, uh, of K. Having added this, we now have enough constraints. This is actually a surprising fact. It's, uh, it's a, it was also something that Faulting's proved. We have, we've kind of pinned the image down enough that this is actually a finite set. So the last thing I'll show, let me call this set something. I mean, I don't know. I'll give it another name next time. Let me just call it R now, because I want to finish. This set R, I mean, so I'm going to call this script R. Okay. Uh, so this, so this set of representations which I have here is finite.